Welcome back to our series, History from St. Paul's at St. Paul's Church National Historic Site, located in Mount Vernon, New York, pictured in these images of the 18th century Masonry Church and the adjoining historic cemetery. Today, in recognition of Women's History Month, we explore the interesting stories of three wives of presidents who visited St. Paul's Church, reflected in this composite image of portraits of many first ladies. All three women came here in the context of their lives as mothers and wives, one of them in grief over the loss of her son, another in support of her overwhelmed daughter, and the other accompanying her husband on a political visit that helped pave the way to the White House. This is a painting of Abigail Adams with her dark hair tied back, a low neckline dress, and pearls around her neck. She visited the church and lived in the community in 1797 wife of President John Adams, she came here because of public health concerns and family need. A yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia, the nation's capital at the time, caused many people to seek a safer place. Abigail Adams Jr., usually called Nabby, shown in this painting with a large floral decorative hat and a noticeably red complexion, had been living for two years around the corner from St. Paul's in the town of East Chester, about 20 miles north of New York City but she was struggling to adjust. Her husband, William Smith, frequently traveled for business and she had two young children at home. Abigail, the first lady, decided she and the president could satisfy the need to leave disease-ridden Philadelphia in the summer and also fulfill an important family obligation by staying with their daughter and grandchildren at the large two-story dormant house with an outdoor porch, which is shown in these 20th century photographs. They lived there for several months and attended services at St. Paul's, located less than a mile away. Accustomed to the excitement of the nation's capital and several European capitals, the First Lady found her neighbors in the St. Paul's vicinity provincial and limited, as she informed her sister in the handwritten letter, which is shown here. I have not yet been into New York, and one might as well be out of America in this village only 20 miles distant from New York for unless we send in on purpose, we cannot even get a newspaper out. Yet we are in sight of the post road. It is quite a village of farmers who do not trouble their heads about anything but the productiveness of their farms. Abigail's daughter-in-law, Louisa Catherine Adams, was the next first lady, lady to visit St. Paul's. Louisa was born in 1775 in England, reflected in this miniature portrait of a young Louisa with curly red hair. She is one of only two first ladies born outside of the United States. Louisa's extraordinary life was marked by extensive travel, residence at some of the leading courts of Europe, personal illness, many years living in Washington, D.C., tragedy and longevity. She met John Quincy Adams, who was eight years older than her, while he was in England on a diplomatic assignment. They married in 1797. By then, John Adams, father of John Quincy, was president so Louisa was marrying into the nation's first family. She lived in the White House from 1825 to 1829, when John Quincy served as the nation's sixth president. She was known for her harp playing. This painting of her at the time in a long white dress and a broad decorative hat shows her leaning on a harp, holding sheet music in one hand. But it was a difficult tenure as first lady, partly because of the bitter politics of the election of 1824 and lingering resentment against her husband. Her visit to St. Paul's came shortly after John Quincy lost his re-election bid of 1828. It was one of the sadder occasions of her life. George Washington Adams, her troubled 28-year-old son, shown in this painting of a seated dark-haired man in a dark suit, had drowned, toppling off a boat in nearby Long Island Sound in late April. His lifeless body, discovered weeks later, was taken in a coffin to St. Paul's, the nearest cemetery, and placed in the Drake burial vault, pending notification of his parents. Louisa and John Quincy had been residing in New York City, fearing the worst, and when the news came of their son's tragic loss, they traveled to St. Paul's on June 22nd. Louisa joined the church minister, Reverend Lawson Carter, in the vault for a brief prayer described in the written diary entry by her husband, which is shown here. The minister offered to open the casket, but the Adams declined. There was a church funeral service. The coffin bearing Louisa's son remained in the vault for about 18 months. 
Then it was transported to the Adams home in Quincy, Massachusetts, where it was buried in the family cemetery. As a token of thanks for the parish's services and the family's time of grief, Louisa donated a lovely silver chalice inscribed with the words, St. Paul's Church, Eastchester, which is shown here. Eleanor Roosevelt was the last of the first ladies to visit St. Paul's and perhaps closest to a traditional understanding of a wife in support of her husband's political aspirations. Eleanor was born in New York in 1884. Her father was a brother of future President Teddy Roosevelt, but she struggled with a very difficult childhood. Both of her parents had died by the time Eleanor was 10, and she was raised by a maternal grandmother. She married her distant cousin Franklin Roosevelt in 1905, captured in his bridal photo, dressed in a long white gown, holding a large bouquet of flowers. They had six children, reflected in this photo of her as a young mother in a white dress and necklace, shown with three of her children, one of them on her lap. Eleanor was forced to adjust to crushing news about her husband's infidelity in 1918, causing a serious but not fatal disruption to their marriage. Shortly after that revelation, Franklin was stricken with polio that halted and nearly ended his promising political career. But Eleanor emerged as a major inspiration who helped him return to public life, winning the race for governor of New York in 1928. Eleanor herself carved out a remarkably active and influential career in the fields of human rights and civil rights for more than 50 years, reflected in this photo of her in a helmet, riding with many other men in a mining cart, which is steered by, steered by a man in a helmet. But when she visited St. Paul's Church on Flag Day, June 14, 1931, it was in support of her husband, who was already being mentioned as a Democratic candidate for president in 1932. Governor Roosevelt had been invited as a keynote speaker for a Descendants Day gathering that began the effort to restore St. Paul's to its original internal appearance and establish the church as a national landmark. In that regard, Eleanor was part of the largest assemblage in the long history of the church with an estimated 7,000 people on hand to witness historical pageants, public addresses, and reenactments. Captured in this image of many people standing and milling around near a speaker's platform in front of the masonry parish hall. She attended divine service in the church and joined a banquet in the parish hall, today's museum visitor center at St. Paul's. Please join us again next time for another edition of History from St. Paul's.